If you would, please remain standing and let's sing together as a group this morning. What a day that will be.
I'm absolutely sure that some of you are wondering, what in the world did they just play? <laughs> that was Last Eight by Floyd Kramer. If you knew my dad, you knew that was one of his favorite songs. In fact, uh, he challenged uh, all three of his children to learn to play that. He would give $50 a piece, and I think every one of us learned it because we wanted that $50. <laughs> but thank you for playing that. That was, If he was off somewhere and there was a piano player, he just knew they had to know that one for sure. I want to welcome you today and uh, the celebration of my dad, Linwood Ham, his life and his home going. Our family, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts and thank you for coming out, giving of your time uh, to honor our loved one, Linwood Ham. Thank you for the heartfelt condolences and for the loving prayers for our family. We need it and we continue to need it. We thank you for your encouragement and your friendship and thank you for just showing us the love of the Lord. We love you, and uh, we're honored and blessed that you're coming out today to be with us. My dad asked me um, some time ago to be one of the preachers at his funeral, and reluctantly I said yes. Uh, but I'm honored that uh, he wanted me to do that. I'm honored to do that this morning. He also asked, asked me and my family to uh, sing, and uh, uh, we're just not able to do that today. And I hope that uh, he'll understand, and I hope you'll give us the liberty uh, to just to be part of the family today. Uh, when I conduct funerals uh, as a pastor, uh, I try to minister to the family in those times like this, and I try to spend a, a little time with the family and lead them in ta talking about their loved one who's gone on. I love to have them tell the stories uh, about their loved ones. I ask them especially the one word that describes that loved one who has passed on. And it always an interesting time to me to, to it reveals a whole lot about that person and, and, the, and, and what's going on. I, I, do, I do it to help uh, because at this time to help get through the grieving process and the good memories are always wonderful and the experiences that, you know, that come from the heart. And today I find myself in that same place, thinking of the one word that, that best describes my dad. And the word that keeps coming is the word that's on the cover, faithful, yeah. faithful. My dad was a faithful husband. He was married to my mom for all these years, 69 years. They celebrated Saturday, and uh, he did his best to make it there, too, and uh, their wedding anniversary was last Saturday, 69 years. He took care of her, and she took care of him. And He was uh, serious about his role as a husband. Uh, when they said their vows, uh, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, they meant it, and they stuck to it. They were faithful to that. He al we always knew that he loved her, and she loved him. He was a faithful husband. He was a faithful father also. He brought us up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. After he got saved in 1967, he made sure that we, we would know what God's word said and he would show it to us. He and mom nurtured us, made a, made a home that would encourage our growth, physically, emotionally, spiritually especially. He not only encouraged us, and, 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 but he, had, he, was, he admonished us. He let us know when we did wrong, and he corrected us, and he made us better because of it. He taught us to work. In fact, one person said about us one time, we work more on accident than most people did on purpose. <laughs> he told us, taught us that we could do anything we set our mind to. He was always there for us. He was a source of strength and wisdom. He was a faithful father. He was a faithful husband. But most of all, he was a faithful servant of God. He wasn't perfect. None of us are. But he did his best to please the Lord. And you could tell that in everything that he did. After he got saved in 1967, he wanted to serve the Lord with all of his heart. And he knew that the Lord was faithful. One of the things he knew is that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My dad's decisions after he was saved were 
prayed through and pleased the Lord. He wanted to please the Lord in everything. I know he was a praying man. I've seen him praying for me. I actually come in at night and seen him on his knees praying for his family. He served the Lord in his church too. Started out teaching the junior boys. And I was privileged to be part of that class. I'll go back and look at it. He was Sunday school department superintendent. He'd give small devotions. And I remember him getting up there. Now, it wasn't easy for my dad to do that to start off with. He was very backwards, he said. In fact, uh, I forget who called on him to pray the first time. He said, I'd rather him hit me right in the stomach than to call on me to pray. He taught Sunday school, Sunday, me in Sunday school class here for years. He would faithfully study God's word, and he would faithfully teach God's word. He was a trustee. He was a deacon for, I guess, 48 years. Some of that time, he was chairman of the deacon board, and he was faithful witness to the Lord also. By God's grace, he knew that the Lord saved him. And, you know, he wanted everyone he came in contact to know about the Lord. He faithfully told his friends, his neighbors, his family, and those who came in contact with him knew he knew the Lord, and he wanted them to know it. He was faithful. Whatever he did for the Lord, he is a faithful servant of the Lord. He was faithful even unto death. On Thursday night, a little after 10 o'clock, he took his last breath. Mom and I were there with him. Several things came to mind at the time. I'll be honest with you, it reminded me of sitting there with Rebecca just before the re rescue squad came. And I, I know that's a difficult time, but I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord allowed me to be there with my dad to those minutes. And the thing that came to mind, honestly, was that where it said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life that fadeth not away. I know that my dad lived with him as a faithful unto death. And the Lord has a crown of life for him, waiting for him when he got there. I know there was a welcoming party. We talked about that. His mama, Amy, and his brother, Reuben, and his close friend, Charlie, and his granddaughter, our child, Rebecca, was there. And with a host of more, that's just a few. But most of all, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, was there. Welcome into heaven. And I can almost hear the words, well done, Linwood Ham. You are good and faithful servant. You've been faithful unto death. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You're now home. One day soon, I want to see him. I want to walk with him on streets of gold. And I want to do something I don't think we've ever done before. I want to sing a duet with him. As we worship the Lord together in heaven forever. Father, I pray right now that you'll touch our grieving hearts. Lord, we don't sorrow as those that have no hope. No, we have a hope. We know where, we know where Dad's at. But Lord, we need your help. And we ask for it. Lord, we're going to miss him dearly. But we look forward to the day we see him again. Give us your strength, wrap your loving arms around us, and carry us through this difficult time. In Jesus' name, amen. A country where no twilight shadows
what heaven means to me. What will it be when we get over yonder and join the throng upon the glassy sea? To join our loved ones and crown Christ forever. Oh, this is just what heaven means to me. Then when at last we'll see the face of Jesus. And before his image, other loves just flee. But when they crown him Lord of all, I'll be there. Oh, this is just what heaven means to me. What will it be when we get over yonder and join the throng upon the glassy sea? heaven means to me. What will it be when we get over yonder and join the throng upon the glassy sea to This is just what heaven means to me. Yes, this is just what heaven means to me. How many of you this morning can envision Brother Linwood? when he got there Thursday night. See, ladies and gentlemen, aren't you glad that's real? That's not just a song. That's truth. That's reality. Now, if you know Brother Linwood well, you know that at times, especially when he was at home with his family or at holiday times and even sometimes around the church when it, the mood was a little light, he'd talk about dancing a little jig. And if you've ever seen him try to do that, <laughs> I just believe, now please don't get mad at me for saying this, I just believe that uh, around 10.30 Thursday night when he got there, I don't know what he did, but I don't think it'd be inappropriate for him to dance a little jig down the streets of glory. Friends who have gathered on behalf of this sweet family, thank you. Your words, your calls, your text messages, the food, the visits, the prayers, the hugs and tears, your words have been used by God to make the difference in these days. I'm glad that we as believers, even though we hurt and grieve, we don't grieve like people that don't have any hope. And one of the things that I've been so, again, reminded of and refreshed by this dear family is the hope that they have had and maintained in Jesus. It's not easy. Probably the darkest days you've ever faced. But aren't you glad that 
The grace of God is real. His presence is real. It's an honor for me and a privilege just to take part in this service. Brother Linwood wasn't a preacher. Now, the kids said that he preached to them and the grandkids all the time. <laughs> Miss Louise said he, he preached to her every morning. <laughs> Brother Linwood wasn't a preacher. But he sure did love preachers. And he loved his preachers. Preacher Davenport. No doubt Preacher Patrick. And he even had enough room in his heart the last six years to love this old boy. And we've all loved him back. Genesis 25 makes an interesting statement about Abraham, the end of his life. I believe you can substitute, and if I can do this without doing any injustice to the scriptures. And Linwood Ham gave up the ghost. And he died in a good old age. An old man. Full of years. And then he was gathered to his people. In 1904, Brown Book Magazine Company sponsored an essay contest. With the winner of the essay contest receiving a grand prize of $250, <laughs> a lady from Iowa by the name of Bessie Stanley entered the contest she won. She won first place. Her essay was entitled, Success. The opening line of her essay reads this way. He has achieved success who has lived well, laughed often, and loved much. Lived well, laughed often, and loved much. You may have even seen signs, especially in some of these stores and uh, uh, Christian bookstores and places where they sell signs and things like that, like, you know, we, we have around here. Uh, the sign says, live, laugh, and love. Live, laugh, love. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd submit to you today that those three words adequately and sufficiently describe Linwood Ham. And according to old Bessie Stanley in 1904, if true success in this world can be summed up in living well, laughing often, and loving much, then Linwood Ham was a huge success in life. He lived well. I don't mean he was wealthy. I don't mean he lived lavishly. I don't mean he lived high. If you know Brother Linwood, you know that wasn't the case at all. <laughs> he might have been one of the tightest men I've ever met in my life. <laughs> but there's a difference in living high and living well. He lived well. He lived full. He too, like Abraham, was full of years. That phrase literally means his years were full. Not just his life, but his years were full. Almost, you know, we say when we talk about somebody that uh, uh, is, is very frugal, that they, they, they pinch every bit they can out of a dime or a penny or what. They can stretch it and make it. Well, I believe Brother Linwood Ham pinched every minute he could out of life. And he lived it to the full. His life was full. It means that Abraham died full. He died, literally it means, he died fully satisfied. Brother Linwood was full with a wonderful family. Full with the favor of God on his life. Full with complete assurance of where he was headed when he left this world. And buddy boy, if there was any person that was ready to go, <laughs> Brother Linwood was ready to go. Now, he wasn't ready to leave his family. He wasn't ready to leave his church. He wasn't ready to leave his friends. But he knew. He, he, he got to the point where he began thinking a whole lot more about that world than this world. He lived well. But he laughed often. 
If you know Mr. Linwood at any at all, you've seen him laugh, or you've been with him when he's laughed, or you've laughed with him. Proverbs 17, 22 reminds us a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Maybe that's one of the reasons the Lord let Brother Linwood live so long. If anyone exhibited the joy of the Lord, Mr. Linwood did. He was a Philippians 4 believer. He rejoiced in the Lord. Paul said rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Mr. Linwood loved people, and he loved laughing with people, and he loved picking with people, and he loved just messing around, just good, clean fun. <laughs> the family even said that he loved even for the telemarketer just to call him. Because he'd get them on the phone and get their goat. He laughed often. He lived well. Then he loved much. Miss Louise, you were the love of his life. For well over seven decades, you were his queen ever since y'all met at that birthday party in Selma. He had eyes for you. Ronnie and Mary Ann, Ricky and Connie, Gail and Steve. He was extremely proud of all of you and loved you dearly. Very proud of all of his grandchildren. <laughs> really, really proud of his eight great grandchildren. He loved his church. Deacon, teacher, trustee, choir member. I remember him talking about in the choir, standing between, you know, Brother Linwood was not tall of stature. Rather on the short side of life. But he was sandwiched at one time right between Russ Moots, and you know Brother Russ Moots, <laughs> and a Brent Patrick, if you know Brent Patrick. And Brother Linwood called them high pockets. <laughs> He said, I can look right down and see right in your pocket. <laughs> you know, it had been a while since he had been able to attend church services. He had it marked on his calendar to be here yesterday. He is in a better service yesterday, I can tell you that much. He is in big church yesterday. He's always talking to folks about the Lord. He loved traditions. He loved holidays. He started the day after July 4th getting ready for Christmas. <laughs> Every year at Christmas when the family would get together down in the basement, he'd have the grandchildren do the Carolina Opry like he saw in Myrtle Beach. <laughs> Except it may include homemade instruments. Homemade costumes, whatever. He loved Jesus. That night when he got saved in revival, Brother Linwood Ham got the full dose. He never was the same since, and he let, ne never looked back. He lived well. He laughed often. He loved much. Thomas Edison was Henry Ford's hero. And in adulthood, Thomas Edison became Henry Ford's best friend. When Edison died at the age of 84 in 1931, in order to remember his hero, Henry Ford had Thomas Edison's son, Charles, sit by his dying father's bedside and Henry Ford asked Charles one last favor. He said, when your daddy takes his last breath, I want you to take a test tube and capture that last breath and seal it up. And Charles did that. Later, when he was able to see Henry Ford again, he gave that test tube to Henry Ford. And that, that very test tube with supposedly... Thomas Edison's last breath is on display even today at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Henry Ford stated that he so revered Edison 
that he wanted to capture something of Edison's spirit. And I'd love to capture something of the spirit of Lynn Woodham. A man who lived well, laughed often, and he loved much. And then like Abraham, he was gathered to his people.
you can tell a lot about a person by their favorite songs. And I believe the songs today has been testimony to this family and to Brother Linwood. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing that with us. What a good job. What a great song. And uh, I, too, along with Brother Christian, am honored to participate in this service today. And uh, certainly our prayer is to honor the Lord Jesus Christ as we remember the life of uh, Brother Linwood Ham. Um, when I came to faith in 1981, Louise was the uh, nursery director and uh, took care of all the babies and uh, did a good job in meeting parents, greeting them, visiting in homes and so on. Linwood was already a deacon. Uh, Ralph Barnes was chairman of the deacon board at the time, but in just a few years would resign that position and the deacons wisely voted for Brother Linwood to be the new chairman. And for over two decades, we served together the Lord in the church as pastor and deacon. In all those days, we never had a disagreement Oh, we may have talked over some things and didn't see eye to eye to begin with, but never had a real disagreement. God gave us a spirit of unity and a commonality about the things of God. And so it was a joy for me to serve with him. Um, when I got news this past week, about uh, Linwood's passing, I, I thought immediately of his last name, uh, Ham. And I thought to myself, well, you know, Linwood had a lot of character, but he was also a character. Uh, he, uh, he was Linwood Ham, but he was also a Ham. Um, I text one person I, about what a good man he was and great Christian and my last words were he was ornery and uh, there was a special way about him that all of us loved a little twinkle in his eye uh, about mischief and the joy of the Lord and uh, having fun laughter as brother Christian has said I thought the, about that name Ham, H, he was a happy man. Lewin Ham, was a ha he was happy because he knew Jesus Christ, his own personal Savior. He was happy because he knew where he was headed when he died. He was happy because his family was following him in the Lord. He was a happy man. He was an active man. He was active in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different places, in a lot of different things. He was active in the church. He spent many hours here as a deacon, many hours as a Sunday school teacher, many hours in visitation, many hours going to church here. He was active with his family. Uh, all of you all know all of the ways that he dreamed up things to have fun and enjoyment, parties and so on. He was active with the family. He was active in the home. He was active with Louise. He was concerned about her and her health in these last days, especially in having to look after him, something she'd never had to do before. He was a man that he did not think W-O-R-K was an ugly word. Uh, he judged people by how you worked. He told me one time, he said, Preacher, your boys are going to be all right because both of them know how to work. And uh, he... Uh, he set the example in that. He was a worker. He, was all, he always had some kind of project, something going on. If you didn't know it, he was an architect. <laughs> if he found a wall, he could build something next to it. He was an engineer. He developed his own set of building codes and regulations, right, Steve? He was an inventor. He didn't throw things away. He made things out of them, like trains and barns. 
things that we would throw. He was a musician. Now, Ricky talked about singing with him in heaven. He didn't do that down here, but he was a true musician. He, he made instruments. Um, he, uh, he and Louise would have people over for parties in their basement, and, and uh, they would feed them. But for Linwood, the food was a ploy. Because as soon as they were through eating, he said, okay, y'all, let's go down into the kind of lower basement area. He'd build a stage down there. <laughs> and the ham minstrels began. And he'd have somebody uh, to uh, read uh, something, somebody to uh, say something. And, and I've seen grown people in that basement do things that only Landwood Ham could get them to do. Strum on a homemade bass fiddle. Uh, if, he, if you could blow on it, <laughs> wave it, shake it. We, I was even there one time when his class had a party and we made butter. Now, how many Sunday school class parties you go to where you can make butter? <laughs> Only Linwood Ham, amen? <laughs> he, uh, he was a... Uh, he was a music. He, he even had his own choir, didn't he? Every Christmas, in the front yard, pictures all of you all. People, hundreds, ride by, perhaps thousands. Who who are those people? Well, I understand that Mr. Linwood Ham lives there, and that's his family, <laughs> and they're all like in the choir. Uh, he was a, a musician. He was an entrepreneur, a true entrepreneur. From clothing to construction to chinchillas. <laughs> he sold Bibles, buses, and books. He operated a gas station. And I did, did I mention the chinchillas? <laughs> Only Linwood Ham. He was a true entrepreneur. He was a happy man, an active man. He was a man. A true man. Um, he knew how to laugh and cry. I wasn't here very long until one day... He came at me with tears in his eyes, and he said, Preacher, he said, you know something about trying to win a soul? He said, God has always allowed me to win a soul that I shed tears over. He said, now, I pray that God would give me tears, that I'd be able to weep over souls, and that God would never take that away from me, and he never did. So many times when he and I would talk, I would see those tears. What verses would I share today? What passage would I speak from? We're in an uh, unusual time. Everybody's talking about the new normal. And I'm not so crazy with what everybody seems to think the new normal is or going to be. I've told everyone I'm, I think I'm going to start a church and call it the old normal, Free Will Baptist Church. <laughs> but I thought about the true old normal. Not 20 years ago, not 100 years ago even. But I'm talking about 2,000 years ago. The old normal. It's when the church was begun there on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching. He says, Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Conviction fell on those people. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
For the promise is unto you and unto your children and to all them that are afar off, thank God. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And our old normal, I believe, is found in verse 42. And they, these new converts, these new believers, this first church, church at Jerusalem, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. There are four things mentioned there in verse 42, our text verse. Luke, the writer, says, and they continued steadfastly in these. J. Vernon McGee says, these are four marks of identification for a real church and a real Christian. I would submit to you today that uh, these were marks, certainly, of Brother Linwood Ham throughout his life as he began to grow, as he began to serve, as he began to share his own faith with others. I like what it says there. They continued steadfastly. One writer said it could also be translated consistently devoted. It modifies each of these four things. The apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. I believe it's appropriate to put that before each of these. I believe those were also true. All of these of Brother Linwood Ham. He continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. It simply means that he read his Bible. He loved to hear the Bible taught. He loved to hear the Bible preach. He loved the Word of God and doctrine. He read it. He studied it. He taught it to others, and most of all today, he lived it. He not only loved the Bible, he lived the Bible. He believed it was inspired. He believed that God created this world. He believed that sin was black, heaven is sweet, hell is hot, and the only way to go to heaven and to miss hell is by trusting Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. He was, he continued steadfastly in fellowship. It's a, the idea of partnership and sharing a common bond. And the common bond was their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It meant that not just that you got together and talked, but there was a basis, a foundation of that fellowship that was in the Lord. Not just drinking coffee together, not just munching on a snack, but there was encouragement and edification in the fellowship. Lynn would love fellowship. He, he enjoyed the talking. He enjoyed the snacking, the eating part. But he enjoyed being a part of bringing others along in the Lord and seeing them grow. And his fellowship was based on the Lord. Their home was used as a place of entertainment, of edification and encouragement to so many. The family, class parties, deacons, the men in the church so often, about once a year he would have a fish stew. And people come from everywhere to eat Brother Linwood's fish stew there in the basement. He loved the holidays, Christmas and so on. He was a positive man. He didn't sing gloom, despair, and agony on me. He was a positive man. He continued steadfastly in fellowship. He not only was planning to come to church, I understand, he wore the calendar out. He was trying to find a date to get family together, get friends together, because he said everybody's been through a hard time with all this COVID stuff. Fellowship. He continued steadfastly in it. He continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread. I believe that means both 
the common meal that the new believers enjoyed together, but it also meant at the end of the meal, since one of the common things on their table would have been the grape juice and the bread, that they remembered the Lord's death often at the close of their meals. And Lynn would serve as a deacon, and many times he and I had the privilege, along with other deacons, staff people, to serve communion to the church family. I've seen him shed tears as we talk about the broken body and the precious blood that was shed for our sins. He and Louise, they're truly family people. They think family and how we can help the family, bring the family along and for Linwood and Louise both to bring them along spiritually. We, uh, they would say to me in those early days, say, well, why don't we have families sit together during communion? And especially at Christmas time, when we would have communion, I always liked the idea of families being together. And out of that arose, we practiced a time or two with families coming to the front, being served by individual deacons up here. I remember what a joy that was to him. He told me later, he's a preacher, he said, that was just such a blessing to see the families come together and to be able to minister to them. He continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread. He continued steadfastly in prayers. He was a praying man. He knew how to get a hold of heaven. Um, this family, and many of you who know Linwood, familiar with his mother, Granny Ham. Granny Ham was a praying woman. She lived with Linwood Louise the last eight years of her life. And uh, God answered her prayers for her boys, Linwood and Reuben. So when I came here, Reuben was chairman of the ushers. Linwood was already a deacon and would become in just a few years chairman of the deacon board. God answered her prayers for those boys and their families. Linwood knew that God heard and answered prayers. He'd seen it in his own mother's prayers. And as God began to answer prayers with his children and their mates and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, other people in the church, he was a praying man. He continued steadfastly I believe <laughs> I believe that's the old normal one writer said he believed it was the cure for backsliding and I say a hearty amen if you continue steadfast if you're consistently devoted to those things you're not going to backslide I believe it's the answer to what we need in our world today. Especially for us Christians to return to God. To our Bibles. To teaching and preaching of the Bible. To fellowship based on the Lord Jesus Christ. To remembering his death for us on Calvary's cross. And calling on heaven. Asking God to hear our prayers. And to heal our land. In uh, a number of years ago, um, my wife uh, had a ladies' meeting, and uh, they the theme was "I'm a child of the King." And she asked the ladies if they would to write a short testimony. Those testimonies were to be turned in, and then typed and put into a booklet form. 
from time to time, we enjoy reading those, uh, some of those testimonies, know how some of these ladies came to know the Lord. There's one in there by Louise Ham. And I close with this. Louise said, I was saved in 1941 in the Selma Baptist Church during a revival. And the next Sunday was baptized. In August of 1965, we moved to Goldsboro. And the second Sunday morning, Linwood, the children, and I started to church. When we got to the highway, it seemed as if our car turned right and we ended up at Faith Church and have been there ever since. Joe Ainge, in 1967, was holding our fall revival when Linwood went forward and was saved. A couple of nights later, I went up and rededicated my life. And then she goes on to say, just think what a glorious day it will be when all is done down here and we can all sing and rejoice at the Lord Jesus' feet together. The Lord has brought me from a lost sinner to a child of the king, saved, saved me and I'm on my way to heaven. And closes it out by saying, come Lord Jesus soon. We join her and John with that prayer too. I thought about many times I've been in y'all's basement. And that you all were basement people. But Linwood's been graduated. He's in the balcony now. And he's joined that great cloud of witnesses that the writer of Hebrews talks about. He's cheering us on. For those that don't know the Lord, he wants you to come to know the Lord so you can come to heaven, join him and others. For those that are not living right, I guarantee you, he said, oh, Lord. I want you to do right, live right. Give your heart and life fully to Jesus. He's now cheering us all on, encouraging us to finish well so that one day it could be said of us what we know is said of him when he stepped on heaven's shore, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's all stand for prayer, please. Father, thank you for Brother Linwood, his life, his testimony, the joy of the Lord that he experienced. Thank you for Louise. Especially comfort her. I know that she had to join in on so many of these endeavors and certainly a part of it, a big part of it. Comfort her in a very special way as only you can. Then, Lord, I pray that you be with each one of the children, be with Ronnie and Marianne and Ricky and Connie. Steve and Gail, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I know they've been called on in these last months. To go through some difficult trials and suffering. But I know you're faithful. And thank you that they know you and know that they can lean on you. Now bless as we continue the service at a cemetery. Just pray for your will to be done. In Jesus' name.
Amen.